In his 1973 book, Clap Your Hands, A Young Catholic Encounters Christ, Larry Tomczak recounts how as a Catholic he missed Mass intentionally for the first time to attend a Pentecostal service at a friend's invitation. A week later, after a second Pentecostal service, he asked Christ to forgive him. Later, Tomczak was baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoke in tongues. At the conclusion of the book, Tomczak says, I stopped at Holy Cross for early Mass. God had used many people and Christian communities to awaken my awareness of His love, but now my eyes were opened to the fullness of His presence in my Catholic faith. The service was so intensely beautiful that it was as if the Lord was showing me the depths of worship attainable in the most familiar liturgy. Tomczak became an evangelical and in 1974, while leading a large prayer meeting called Take and Give, he met C.J. Mahaney, who only two years before had himself converted from Catholicism. Take and Give evolved into Covenant Life Church, and Mahaney became the senior pastor in 1977. Five years later, in 1982, Mahaney and Tomczak would found what was called a family of churches, People of Destiny International, which was later shortened to PDI Ministries. Of that change, Mahaney said, For some time we had desired to change our name from People of Destiny International because of its man-centered emphasis and because there have been occasions when the name has been misunderstood. We selected this name in the 1970s because of our belief that the Church of Jesus Christ worldwide is composed of people having a God-given destiny. Obviously, we still believe that. However, over the years, some have wondered whether the name reflects a belief that the churches we have the privilege to start and serve are somehow unique in this regard. We have never believed that, and even the possibility of such a perception concerns us greatly. An interview with Charisma magazine tells how Tom Zak viewed his departure from People of Destiny in 1997. In 1997, Tom Zak says, the leadership refocused, taking on a more reformed Calvinistic theology, and he could no longer align himself with their vision. I came to a defining moment where I felt I no longer fit with the direction some of the other men were going with the ministry, doctrinally and directionally, says Tom Zak. In 2002, PDI Ministries renamed to Sovereign Grace Ministries, and finally in 2014 to Sovereign Grace Churches. SGC affirms the Trinity, Christ's virgin birth, divinity and humanity, and sinlessness. Christ is the all-sufficient Savior and only mediator between God and man. He died and resurrected and is the Messiah. There is guarantee of a future resurrection. Penal substitutionary atonement is affirmed. On the nature of God, the statement of faith says that his knowledge is exhaustive, including all things actual and possible, so that nothing past, present, or future is hidden from his sight. This clearly excludes views like open theism, which deny God's knowledge of future human decisions. Against the view of soul sleep, it is affirmed that when a person dies, their soul is immediately in God's presence, awaiting the redemption of their body. Of the sacraments, the statement of faith says, The sacraments are precious means of grace that signify the benefits of the gospel, confirm its promises to the believer, and visibly distinguish the church from the world. The only two are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is by immersion and with a triune formula and for believers and not infants. On the efficacy of baptism, it is stated, Although commanded by Christ and a true means of grace, grace is not so inseparably tied to baptism that no one can be saved without it, or that everyone who is baptized is thereby saved. On the presence of Christ in communion, SGC claims the Reformed view, stating of their viewpoint, it embodies Calvin's emphasis on the spiritual nourishment derived from Christ's spiritual presence, without detailing views on the nature of his presence, against a strictly memorialist view. The scriptures are the 66 books of the Bible, which was given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, which is perfect, infallible, and inerrant, and no new normative revelation will be given until Christ returns. It is the supreme and final rule of faith and life. On creation, the statement of faith says in part, In the beginning the triune God freely created out of nothing the universe and everything in it by the word of his power, all for his own pleasure and the display of his glory. The editor's edition clarifies, by specifying God's direct creation, the statement denies any form of theistic evolution that distances God from the work of creation. And also, although the section articulates an orthodox view of God's direct, intentional, and sovereign creation as reflected in Genesis 1 and affirmed throughout Scripture, it refrains from taking a specific position on, for example, the age of the earth or the meaning of day in Genesis 1 thus allowing for a circumscribed range of views on such issues that are held by conservative commentators and consistent with a high view of Scripture. Adam and Eve are affirmed as literal human beings from which every person has descended. Adam's sin brought enmity with God and death, which was passed on to all of humanity, and people are by nature corrupt and inclined to evil. 
Salvation is through faith alone, as is stated in the statement of faith. For those who place their faith in Jesus Christ, God's righteousness requires no further sacrifice for sin, nor is there any human achievement or merit to be added to Christ's accomplishment. The atoning work of Christ is wholly efficacious, securing the full salvation of all the elect by purchasing the forgiveness of sins, the gifts of faith and repentance and eternal life. There is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. The soteriology of Sovereign Grace Churches as Calvinist, as shown in their first of seven shared values titled Reformed Theology, and in their statement of faith, God in his great love before the foundation of the world chose those whom he would save in Christ Jesus. God's election is entirely gracious and not at all conditioned upon foreseen faith, obedience, perseverance, or any merit in those whom God has chosen. His decision to set his saving love on the elect is based entirely on his sovereign will and good pleasure. The number of God's elect is fixed for eternity, and no one who has been chosen by God will be lost. In the mystery of his will, God passes over the non-elect, withholding his mercy and punishing them for their sins as a display of his holy justice and wrath. Those who are saved cannot again be lost. The statement of faith says, Those whom he has predestined are redeemed by Christ, effectually called to faith by his Spirit, justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by God's power to the end. And also, believers must persevere in faith and obedience in order to be saved, yet this perseverance is also a gift of God in Christ, who preserves his own and keeps them safe forever. More than simply ordaining the salvation of the elect, the statement of faith also affirms God's ordination of all things. From all eternity, God sovereignly ordained all that exists and all that occurs in his creation in order to display the fullness of his glory. God's plans are efficacious, always coming to pass, and they are universal, encompassing all the affairs of nature, history, and individual lives. These decrees are an exercise of his free, unchangeable, wise, and holy will. Yet God, in his foreordination, is not the author of sin, nor do his decrees negate the will of his creatures who act with the power of willing choice in accord with their nature. His ordaining and governing all things is compatible with his creatures' moral accountability, such that God never condemns a person unjustly. Therefore, all persons are responsible for their actions, which have real and eternal consequences. In the editor's edition of the Statement of Faith, here it is said, This portion of the Statement of Faith helps establish it as a more broadly reformed document that celebrates God's sovereignty, not simply in salvation, but over all things, and his glory as the ultimate purpose for everything. The editor's edition also states that this paragraph excludes a view of middle knowledge, therefore ruling out a Molinist position. On sanctification, the statement of faith says, The ultimate goal of sanctification is our full conformity to Christ's image, which will finally come when believers are raised physically with Christ in glory, freed from sin, and exulting in the presence of God forever. The third of SGC's seven shared values is continuationist pneumatology, and it says, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, God's purpose to dwell among his people entered a new era. We believe the Holy Spirit desires to continually fill each believer with increased power for Christian life and witness, including the giving of his supernatural gifts for the building up of the church and for various works of ministry in the world. We are eager to pursue God's active presence in all its breadth, that Christ may be magnified in our lives, in the church, and among the nations. Beyond this, sovereign grace has self-identified as charismatic, though they did this more in the past than they do today. In 2014, their About Us page said, We are evangelical, reformed, and charismatic. But in 2015, they said, Our beliefs can be described as evangelical, reformed, and continuationist. As stated in the Statement of Faith, all believers are indwelt by the Spirit, and then says that all Christians, therefore, must continually seek to be filled with the Spirit by living and praying in such a way that invites the Spirit's work among us, actively longing for God to accomplish His gracious purposes in us and through us. The editor's edition clarifies on this, It should be noted that this section does not dictate a particular position on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. For many years now, our statement of faith has allowed for a range of views on this issue, including both Pentecostal charismatic views that see spirit baptism as subsequent to, or at least distinct from, conversion, minus the insistence on tongues as initial physical evidence, and so-called third-wave views that see the baptism of the Spirit as part of conversion under the New Covenant. As this allowance has proven both wise and workable, we opted not to take a stance on certain issues where continuationists differ, and especially not to insist on a position that would automatically exclude any current pastors in sovereign grace. A previous position of sovereign grace was that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is an experience distinct from conversion. 
As can be noted in the previous statement, the Pentecostal initial evidence doctrine that when someone receives Holy Spirit baptism, they necessarily speak in tongues is denied. On gifts of the Spirit, it is stated that in addition to giving new life, the Spirit sovereignly bestows gifts on every believer, and also the gifts are not to be exercised with apprehension, pride, or disorder, but with faith, love, and order, and always in submission to the authority of Scripture as the final revelation of God. With the exception of those among the apostles who were commissioned as eyewitnesses of Christ and made recipients of normative revelation, the full range of spiritual gifts remain at work in the church and are given for the good of the church and its witness to the world. We are therefore to earnestly desire and practice them until Christ returns. On the gift of tongues, Sovereign Grace stated in an annotation to their old statement of faith, it would appear from the book of Acts that speaking in tongues is a common evidence of receiving this baptism, but it is not a necessary evidence and it's not the only evidence. Although speaking in tongues is a biblical experience that Christians should pursue, baptism in the Spirit is not primarily about speaking in tongues or personal experience, but about receiving power from God that we might be more effective in accomplishing His purposes. Neither the SGC website or Statement of Faith discuss the gift of healing. Tim Challies in 2006 attended a Sovereign Grace Conference. He said of his experience there, while there may not have been any public uses of the gift of tongues, there were a great deal of prophetic utterances, both in the main sessions and in seminars. These utterances were often spoken in the first person. They were sometimes words from the Lord, and at other times were images or encouragements. At one point, Bob Coughlin mentioned that prophecies were not allowed to include words about dates, mates, correction, or direction. The position of Sovereign Grace Churches on eschatology is allowed to vary somewhat. After stating in the Statement of Faith that, At the appointed time known only to God, Jesus Christ will return to the earth in power and glory as Judge and King, to whom every knee will bow, the editor's edition comments, The timing of Christ's return and of the resurrection of believers and unbelievers is intentionally avoided here, those being the most disputed points in the various end times positions. It also states, it should be noted that no position is taken on the meaning and nature of the millennium in Revelation 20, as has been the case in Sovereign Grace historically. This leaves room for a range of millennial views, including amillennial, historic premillennial, and postmillennial views. However, the dispensational premillennial view, which in its classic form asserts a pre-tribulation rapture and a clear distinction between the church and Israel, including a difference in time between Christ's ingathering of the two groups, would find no support in this statement. A bit later, in discussing final judgment, that view is once again called out as unacceptable when it is stated, the dispensational premillennial idea that distinguishes between various judgments, a judgment of the nations before the millennium, a judgment of believers' works, and a great white throne judgment of non-believers at the end of the millennium, is also excluded. On human sexuality, gender is stated as designated by God through our biological sex and not fluid. SGC affirms complementarian leadership in the home and the church as one of its seven shared values. They say, We believe it was God's glorious plan to create men and women in His image, giving them equal dignity and value in His sight, while appointing differing and complementary roles for them within the home and the church. Because these roles give different expressions to God's image in humanity, they should be valued and pursued in joy and faith. As the redeemed community of God, the church has a unique opportunity and responsibility to celebrate this complementarity, to contend for it against cultural hostility, and to protect it from sinful distortions. Marriage is between one man and one woman, which is the only normative pattern of sexual relations. Husbands are to exercise headship, and wives are to serve as helpers. SGC's Statement of Faith and website says nothing of divorce, indicating that this sensitive situation is left to the oversight of the local church. In speaking of the requirement that an elder be the husband of one wife, the Book of Church Order says, The requirement here does not speak to whether a man has been divorced or remarried, but, if he is married, speaks to a general faithfulness and sexual purity in his current marriage. He is a one-woman kind of man. Of course, a man's marital history is relevant to establish his character, but his marital history is not primarily in view in these verses. On abortion, the statement of faith says, All people remain God's image bearers, capable of fellowship with him, and possessing intrinsic dignity and value at every stage of life, from conception to death. The editor's edition comments, The statement also provides a foundation for contemporary discussions of medical ethics, abortion, end-of-life issues, etc. There are no other statements made on the topic. Of worship style, the SGC website has said, The music is often contemporary, but you'll hear hymns too. Our songs aim to promote strong doctrine, and they frequently celebrate the cross of Christ. The songs being spoken of are often songs from Sovereign Grace Music, whose director Bob Coughlin says, 
For the past 30 plus years, Sovereign Grace Music has been seeking to produce songs for local churches that are theologically driven, gospel-centered, and musically engaging. SGC doesn't require abstinence from alcohol. In a Sovereign Grace Church's booklet, SGC missionary Michael Granger tells of a conversation he had with a man from another denomination. First, he asked, are Christians allowed to drink alcohol? I responded with a question. What was Jesus' first miracle? Once he saw I wasn't condemning things the Bible doesn't condemn, he began rapidly firing off even more questions. Sovereign Grace churches commonly do teach tithing. One church says, We recommend that you prayerfully consider giving a tithe, a tenth, to the church as a starting point for your giving. Offerings can be given beyond this amount as God so leads you. The SGC website has stated, Small groups are a major part of all Sovereign Grace churches. These groups may be organized by location, by season of life, or in some other way, but they are always intended to build community and foster growth in godliness. They're where real life happens. On the offices of the church, the statement of faith says, Christ has given the offices of elder and deacon to the church. Elders occupy the sole office of governance and are called to teach, oversee, care for, and protect the flock entrusted to them by the Lord. Deacons provide for the various needs of the church through acts of service. Churches are governed by elders, which are men and not women. The fifth of the seven shared values is on elder-governed and elder-led churches and says, Jesus Christ reigns as head over his church, and he gives to his church elders or pastors to govern and lead local churches under his authority. We believe that men, qualified by both character and gifting, are to serve as elders, shepherding God's people as under-shepherds of Christ. A church's health is to a great degree dependent on the health of its elders, and so our aim is to strengthen the current elders in our churches while identifying and training new ones. The Book of Church Order says each church should strive to have a plurality of elders, according to the biblical precedent and prescription, and elders ought to receive compensation and congregations have a correlative duty to pay them if possible. After a detailed look into biblical qualifications of elders, it is stated, although they must meet biblical qualifications, they do not need to be seminary or pastor's college graduates. Although local churches have much freedom in their own operation, polity is not only congregational. The BCO says no congregational vote shall be regarded as binding in any sovereign grace church. While full and vibrant congregational participation is necessary for healthy church life, it does not necessitate congregational governance of the local church. The BCO also states, Elders in a local church are accountable to the other elders in their region and ultimately to all the elders in Sovereign Grace. Regional assemblies with their judicial review committees and the Council of Elders, along with the Sovereign Grace Court of Appeal, provide accountability for the life and doctrine of elders in Sovereign Grace. And also, appointing a man to the office of elder involves a collaborative effort between the elders and members of a local church and the Regional Assembly of Elders. When new elders are chosen, members of the churches are invited to provide feedback, but this is not viewed as some kind of binding vote. Instead, each church eldership has the responsibility and authority to select, test, and ordain future elders in a manner of their choosing. If, for whatever reason, there come to be no elders in a church, the Regional Assembly of Elders takes the authority to appoint them. Local churches in SGC are to give 10% of general fund incomes to SGC, half which goes to the region and half to central. In addition to the Regional Assembly of Elders is the Council of Elders, which meets at least once a year. There is also a leadership team. The BCO states the leadership team is appointed and empowered from our Council of Elders and Executive Committee for the express purpose of providing leadership that is biblical, humble, faith-filled, discerning, and gospel-centered. The Statement of Faith Editor's Edition comments in the section on spiritual gifts that, Beyond this, the statement does not go into detail concerning offices, and in so doing, this clearly makes room for an ongoing gift of apostleship or an apostolic gifting as, for example, a pioneer church planner and shepherd to other pastors. Written this way, the statement stops short of insisting on an apostolic gifting in a way that might exclude a pastor who is uncertain about this way of articulating such a gifting. Likewise, the BCO says, Apostles and elders govern the churches of the New Testament. Sovereign grace churches allow for the belief in modern-day apostles or apostolic leadership without requiring it or explicitly featuring it in their polity. The Sovereign Grace Perspectives book on polity stated, While Sovereign Grace Ministries heartily agrees that no one in the church today functions with the authority of the original apostles, let us not hastily extrapolate on Dr. Robertson's phrase to conclude that no one today functions as an apostle of any kind. For many years, the leadership of SGC used the term apostolic team. 
Only men may be elders, but for deacons, the Book of Church Order says, Although we wholeheartedly affirm the vital importance of the ministry of women in our churches, individual churches may differ on the acceptability of having women serve in the role of deacon. If a church decides to appoint women deacons, it is essential that the responsibilities of that role not violate other scriptural commands that define and delineate the respective roles of men and women in the home and the church, particularly those that prohibit a woman from teaching or having authority over a man in the home or church. Churches in Sovereign Grace churches can also be connected with other fellowships or conventions. For example, Sovereign Grace Church of Louisville is where C.J. Mahaney, co-founder of SGC and president until 2013, is senior pastor. Other pastors there are Bob Coughlin of Sovereign Grace Music and Jeff Perswell, Dean of Sovereign Grace Pastors College. The church also partners with the Southern Baptist Convention and is listed as an SBC church on the SBC website. As of 2021, the Sovereign Grace Church's website lists 65 churches in the U.S. and 32 outside of the U.S. Due to a large and very public controversy over the responses to two cases of child abuse within two churches, many churches withdrew in the decade of the 2010s, one of which was the flagship church Covenant Life Church, which had been pastored by Mahaney, and following that pastored by Joshua Harris. Ten other exiting churches formed a new denomination called Trinity Fellowship Churches. For more information and comparisons between Christian denominations, subscribe to Ready to Harvest.